What are some ways that we can look at the Bible to help us understand it better? That's what we're going to talk about today. Down through the years, I turned to the Bible and found that it had all I needed. Ruth Bell Graham. Today we're going to talk about ways of looking at the Bible. I got some inspiration from Father Mike Schmitz, and he talked about some different ways of looking at the Bible that will help us better understand it. And so I started doing some investigations at different ways that we can look at the Bible. And people get caught up in this idea of, do I look at the Bible as a piece of history? Do I look at the Bible as a piece of wisdom literature? Do I look at the Bible as parables and stories? As a cultural practice, tradition of person to person, handed down generation after generation, do we look at it as literal? philosophical, historical, allegorical? And I think the answer to that is, yes, all of that. I think we look at the Bible as all those things. Even as someone who knows different people who don't believe the Bible literally, they still believe in the value of the lesson. I know people who believe in the Bible literally. It has literal, philosophical, historical, allegorical benefits to all of it. Even Genesis is a story of history, but it's also the story of God's love for us, the important message of God creating us, creating this world and his intention for it. Or when we look at parables, are we looking at them as literal stories or are we looking at them as something that is meant to teach a lesson? Maybe both or maybe just one of them. It depends on where you're looking. So the idea is that you want to take a look at the Bible in a couple of different ways that will help you through it. And so the first question when you're reading a part of the Bible is, what genre is this particular chapter? Is it a history lesson like Acts is telling us what happened after Jesus died and was resurrected? Or is it more like Psalms, where it's poems and music meant to inspire us, meant to drive emotion? Or is it a passage that's trying to teach a particular lesson, maybe a prophet who is trying to impart some very important wisdom about what it is God is seeking from his people and maybe how a particular person's not living up to that standard. But when you're looking at it, you have to look at a couple of different ways. Is first of all, what translation are you using? Is it a translation that's more literal? Is it a translation that tries to get to the gist of what it means? even if it isn't the literal translation, or there are translations that are just meant to be easy reading, something that's easy to absorb. All those translations have their good places at different moments. Sometimes we just want to read the Bible easily. Sometimes we want to do a deep dive into it. Then we also have to look at what language was it spoken in. Greek is very expressive, as I'm learning, and Hebrew is very old and very historic. And it is a language that grew over time, evolves over time. And we've seen in our own lives how language evolves. Is this a chapter that requires deep study? Do we need to know what's going on in this chapter? I found it helpful to me to hear about Jesus last week in context of the political history that was going on with the Sadducees and the Romans in the spiritual history that was going on with the scribes, the Pharisees, and the people. Sometimes it requires a little bit of study to understand why this chapter says what it says. The other part of it, too, is can you answer questions that you have in other parts of the Bible? If there's a hint that something is going to happen, do we read how it happens later on? Is what we're reading right now having to do with how we should think and live? in terms of justice, forgiveness, mercy, compassion? Is it about the church and how the church should be structured? Is it about tradition and how God's tradition of worship is meaning to push us along? Is it about people and their viewpoints and how they worked with each other inside of Judaism, inside of the early church? Are we supposed to learn a lesson about how people get along? Is this a literal area or is this an allegorical or parable area? 
what is, and this is the most important part, is God trying to teach us in this chapter? I think one of the interesting things about doing a Bible study myself is that someone said about my own Bible study, don't let it make you arrogant. And I thought, boy, I think me studying the Bible and doing a podcast on it is the opposite of arrogance. I think it's putting me in my place. It's keeping me humble. This is hard stuff, you know, and sometimes it's difficult to understand what is happening and to do a deep dive and to learn how God is talking about people and what they're doing. And that is just humbling. And I think that if you are walking away from your study of God, humble, desiring more, wanting to bring yourself closer, you're on the right track of it. And sometimes when we have difficulties in the Bible, because it is sometimes difficult to understand, how can we learn at this contradiction? Sometimes it will be something like Matthew said there was two people and Mark said there was one person. Well, that's not bad. Mark is discussing this one person and Matthew wanted to bring out the fact that there were two people. That's not an opposition of each other. Sometimes in Mark, things were consolidated because he was trying to tell stories because he was trying to give the gospel to Romans who wanted action, who wanted Jesus to be a man of action and didn't care about the prophecies while Mark cared about the prophecies. And Luke, Luke is going to care about telling the Gentiles, which may be Greek, may be Roman, might be Syrian, might be someone else entirely about the sense of God. And he gives it a richness and a warmth that the other two don't. Meanwhile, John, he had the ability to look back over time. Chances are he was writing this while he was in exile. And the apostles were probably all dead but him. He could give it that overview. So sometimes when we see things that are contradictions, they're really not. They're just two different people describing something for different purposes. But then what do we do when we hit something that is actually truly difficult? The one thing that you have to realize is people have been studying scripture for 2,000 years. There are commentaries stacked upon commentaries to help you get through this. Try to not just invent something, but stand on the shoulders of giants. Find commentaries. Talk to your pastor. Talk to people in your church about commentaries they like. There are a few I have found invaluable. One of them is Matthew Henry's commentary. Now, the one thing you have to know about that is it is very detailed and it's very slow to go through. There's another fellow on the internet who created basically his own commentary because he wanted his own notes so that when he preached to his own church, he would have these detailed notes about any passage. Put them on the internet. You can go to his website and look them up. And so sometimes he provides some valuable insight. And I found there is this series of books called The People's Bible, published by Northwestern Publishing House. And it, I've never read these particular commentaries before, but they're very good. It talks about the cultural side of things. It talks about the historic side of things. It talks about the message that we should walk away with. This message is in context of what was happening at that moment. I've been very impressed with that entire series of books. But you can use the commentaries that make sense to you, but also commentaries that sometimes challenge your viewpoints. Bob Guzak, and he clearly has a different, you know, basic viewpoint than I have, but I've learned so much from him. There has been another commentary that I complained about in the past couple of podcasts. He has a different viewpoint than I do about the Bible entirely, but it has had valuable moments in it. He has made me think about things I hadn't really thought about. It's not just good to work at the commentaries you like. Sometimes it's good to look at the commentaries that go against what you believe so that you can see other people's point of view in it. Maybe it's a blind side for you and that you don't see the full message of it. Then you also have all sorts of resources, YouTube, podcasts, or blogs that can help you through it. I tend to have a very practical viewpoint of the Bible. I believe that the Bible was written for regular Joe Schmoes, people who were working people. There were, of course, kings and queens and 
rich people and high up people and scholars in the Bible. But for the most part, everyone was a working person. Everyone had jobs. They all did things. They all were what we would consider to be tradesmen, tradeswomen, regular old people. And so the Bible is written at a level, I believe, so that a regular person can understand it. I try to go from that viewpoint of this is not meant to be something that was very hard for a common person to understand. Over the years, they think the Bible was written down very early, but for the most part, people couldn't read. So much of it was transmitted through oral tradition, meaning they were telling each other this, memorizing it, and then telling other people. So it had to be easy to read, easy to understand, and easy to memorize. So I tend to look at the Bible through that interpretation. I also believe it is the Word of God that He, through the Holy Spirit, inspired the writers of the Bible to tell us the truth about the things we needed to know. We are so lucky to have a written scripture. People didn't have the full Bible in their own language until quite recently, to be honest. Luther wrote it in German, a very common German, so people could understand it. Tyndale wrote it in English, was put to death for that. But still, we haven't had a written Bible for very long. So we are very lucky that we do. But now that allows us to study, to do deep dives, to talk to each other about it. But also you're trying to look at it as that nothing in the Bible really stands out in opposition to itself. So you can use the Bible to help you translate the Bible. When you see a story and something seems like an outlier, God says something that is shocking. Why is that? Why is it that the way it is? Is it because he is talking to people who are very primitive in that era? that they came from a situation where people worshipped what they thought were other gods, people were doing animal sacrifices, people were doing nation-building and invading kinds of things. And so God is talking to a people who understands the world through that lens. Then later, God is talking to a group of people who understand what it means to be under the thumb of another nation. And sometimes God is talking to people who understand, particularly Jesus, what it is to be an outcast, what it is to be different than the regular people he usually talks to. So there are times where you can look at it and say, wow, God said something that seems to me to be very unkind. Why was this? And go through and do a deep dive into it. Figure out what it is. We can use Bible to interpret the rest of the Bible. When I asked my pastor who baptized me some questions about it, he says, always keep in mind, God is 100% just and 100% merciful. And if you always know those two things about him, you can understand what it is he's trying to do. Also realize, too, that sometimes translations aren't exactly perfect. In reading various books about the translations, they tried very hard to get these words right, these concepts right. Some of them are very focused on getting the translation right word for word, but then the meaning is lost in it. Then there's other translations that's trying to get the meaning correct, but get the word wrong. And so sometimes it helps when we're looking at the Bible and trying to interpret what's going on to look at multiple translations to see how different translations say that sentence in a different way. And I tend to look at the Bible as, again, that these are just people. They were working people, regular people. They weren't dumb. They just didn't have formal education. But sometimes we are talking about a group of people through the context of a different culture. Everyone around them was sacrificing animals to their gods. And so sacrifice was a day-to-day part of people at that time. So sacrifice was done. Then you had other periods of time where sacrifice was no longer called for, it was no longer appropriate, and it's not appropriate for us either. But he was talking to a different culture in a different time. And that matters when you're looking at pieces of the Bible. I think it's important too to say that just because I can't figure out what's going on doesn't mean that some explanation of it doesn't exist somewhere. Try to dig deep into these Bible difficulties that you're having if you get stuck in a particular area. The reason I wanted to do this Bible study 
the Bible in small steps. And why I was going to do it personally is it's easy when you're doing read the Bible in a year podcast. And I have done them for a couple of years and I still do two of them now. But when you have to go through chapter by chapter and even more so when I have to explain it to other people that I'm doing this podcast for, I have to figure it out. Why did God say the thing about the wineskin? What does that even mean? Why did God say that people will not understand this and their hearts will be hardened? Is he hardening their hearts? Or is the process of listening to God's word hardening their hearts because they are hardened people? We have to go through that. I think we look at, too, that most of the people in the Bible were fallible, sinful, they made horrible mistakes. I always mention that my dad said that the Bible was propaganda pieces for individual nations or individual people. And I thought, boy, this is the worst propaganda piece ever because what you read is people screw up. David did horrible things. Solomon did horrible things, but God loved them just like he loves us. And so we have to realize that while the people made mistakes, God does not. His love is perfect, his justice is perfect, and his mercy is perfect. And so when we put it in context of that, we'll understand what's happening better. And then the last thing is get help. We all have probably pastors or people who have studied the Bible that we reach out to. That is something is really confusing, really hard to understand. Go ahead and ask them that question. And don't be afraid to ask them the question. That's what they're there for. People who are pastors. And in the church as servants, study the Bible specifically so that they could answer some of these questions. And then in the end, there are great resources out there. There's fantastic books. There's books on difficulties in the Bible. You can find them on Amazon. What I use is I use the Logo software. And what's really great, I think, about Logo software is that you can take a particular passage and highlight it and do a deep dive into it through the software. It's going to bring up any book that brings up that chapter, brings up that phrase. So if I say, I don't really understand what it means to have the keys of the kingdom, Logos will help me do a study on the keys of the kingdom. And every time it was mentioned, and famous books, well-established books about what that means. So my challenge to you is to start reading the Bible and start looking at the different ways we can look at the Bible. It is not one cohesive thing, but some of it literature, some of it art, some of it poetry, and some of it straight out history. But all of it is something that God wanted us to hear. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com or you can message me on Twitter, now X, if you want to as well. Here's the thing to know that if you are listening to this podcast and you have something to say, I get a ton of spam on almost every different service, whether it's comments on my website, Small Steps with God, whether it's in Twitter or an email. So if you are listening to this podcast and you have something to say, make sure you mention that you're listening to this podcast. If you want to talk about a particular episode, mention which episode you'd like to talk about. Or if you just want to say hi, that's fine too. But identify yourself as a listener. And remember, our walk through the scripture and all the difficulties it can throw our way starts with small steps. <laughs>